Well, hello, everybody. I'm Helen Cooper, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Helen Cooper School of Luxury. And today I am truly delighted to be joined by Pratik uh, Bakhtiani, who is from the Ether Chocolate Company. He's the founder and the chef. Now, there are occasions where I get to talk to certain brands that I've been admiring from a distance for a long time. And today I'm delighted to say this is one of those. If anybody knows about the modules and the courses that we're running, I actually take a sector like chocolate and I've evaluated the level of luxuriousness of different <laughs> European, UK and Indian brands. And Ether Chocolate actually came out the highest of all of those that I've been evaluating. So I'm delighted to be able to talk to the founder and find out exactly how we get to that beautiful luxury point. The purpose of the In My Experience conversations is to share the journey, the motivations, and also the tips for success of other entrepreneurs to encourage people at looking at how they can improve or in fact, even invent their own brands for the future. We're joined, as always, by Shreya Agarwal, who will be ably guiding our conversation. But uh, first of all, let me just welcome you, Pratik. Hello, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Those are very, very kind words. And I do promise I will 100% have them get to my head. So <laughs> thank you for that. that's a pleasure. And I'm so glad I came to find you in your beautiful atelier as well. So, uh, Shreya, let me pass it over to you. Thanks, Helen. Thank you for a lovely introduction as always. And thank you, Pratik. Uh, Helen indeed is quite happy to have met you and finally, you know, get a chance to speak about one of favorite Indian brands. Uh, in fact, when she reached out to me the first time we ever had a conversation, the first brand she ever mentioned that have you heard about Ethu Chuckles from India? And I think at that point I was fairly new and I was like, yes, I've heard of them but I haven't researched much about them. And today here we are finally getting to have a chat with you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you again for having me. Um, so why don't we actually have a quick introduction about yourself, a little bit about the brand for those who don't know about it. Right, I'll, I'll take a slightly less um, uh, flattering approach. Um, <laughs> uh, hi, hello, my name is uh, Chef Pratik. I'm the head chef and creative director here at the Ether Atelier. Um, I, uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm predominantly a chef. That is my, my primary crafts, uh, my, my primary expertise in craftsmanship. Um, albeit, I think, uh, what, uh, I've come to be known for is building, um, ether out into, um, uh, one of the few sort of, um, one of the few food based and F&B companies that has, um, unwavered in its respect for the artisanal way of working and, and I uh, very truly believe and I don't know how much uh, how kosher this is to say to somebody that's running a luxury school but I do truly believe that um, the fact that we are perceived as a luxury uh, brand is a uh, byproduct of, of the fact that uh, we've microcosmically stuck to this this uh, respect for the artisanal spirit and the artisanal um, uh, sort of way of making decisions. Mm. Um, I have wavered from speaking about from introducing myself yet again. Uh, but going back a little in time, I, I started uh, Ether almost three years ago now. Uh, almost three three years, say two weeks. So oh, it's almost happy birthday to Ether here. Uh, we're all very excited. <laughs> I hope you're going to have a nice cake. Well, uh, uh, nobody oh. buys me cakes. That is the one thing. If you're going to be a pastry chef, nobody buys, oh, you could have made yourself a cake. Oh, no, I'm not going to make myself a cake. Um, no, I started Ether about three years ago, before which I was, um, I was working my way across the world, sort of trying to get, trying to learn uh, culinary, culinary techniques from um, as many sort of modern uh, pastry innovators as I could, uh, most notably uh, and most recently in uh, Las Vegas at the Aria with chef uh, Melissa Coppel. Uh, before that, in uh, at the Zilt in Belgium at um, at the EPGP in Tijuana in Mexico. 
uh, and then all the way back and, and rather embarrassingly uh, at uh, Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, um, veritable Emily. Um, but yeah, no, that's 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 a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, yeah, there we are. Lovely. I mean, yes, I'm sure Paris would have been lovely for you. Um, I mean, I don't remember even one single day without going without going uh, to my pastry shop in Paris and loading on calories there. But yes. um, very interesting. That's the, one, that's the good thing about being a pastry chef. You could just like graciously get that. Yeah. <laughs> Still, that doesn't count for you though, as of now. So that's good for you. <laughs> Um, why don't you talk about um, how you positioned the brand by naming it as an atelier and um, the reason why I'm asking you this is Pratik because um, not many will be well versed with the concept of atelier in India and uh, how, how, how do you think your business approach also uh, is kind of directed by this name, this terminology and does your audience even understand that? Right. Um, so, so when I started Ether, I, I, it was, it was a lot more. Um, it was a lot less defined as to what I thought atelier culture was, and, and I think I'm sure as a school of luxury, this is an issue that you face a lot, right? There's, you have an understanding of what like speaking to yeah. a luxury buyer is and, and yeah, you yeah. think that you know you you say oh you have to be kind and that that word kind or you have to be intelligent when you speak to a luxury buyer that word intelligent i think you i you have a, a very intuitive way of understanding it but until you sort of caught it by it mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to sort of communicate yeah. that so yeah when i started ether uh, mm -hmm. it was something that i almost threw around because i understood what atelier culture was mm -hmm. but i think as Ether has grown, it's something that in order to keep it at the heart of what we do, it has become very important for us to sort of in words codify what we mean by the artisanal spirit. Uh, and the way that we define it is in four parts. Um, in, in no particular order, the first part, um, I think the, the first part for, for us, number one is who are you cooking for? As an, as an artisan, as a artisanal, Atelier, one thing that I am very steadfast to when creating the product, when creating the recipes, is that I am cooking for myself. As mm -hmm. long as I like it, it is right. I, we don't, I mean, we're more than happy to, you know, we're, we're very, very excited by customer feedback, um, especially when it's positive. Um, but yeah, if it's negative and if it's negative in so much that it addresses sort of, oh, that was too salty or that was too sweet or that was too banana-y, I'm sorry, you didn't go to school for seven years, I did. Um, it, it is it is one of those very clarifying tenants. If, if it's, it's very, it, it gives a lot of clarity to, to the kind of work that we do and it gives a lot of confidence, right? I think. I'm, I'm sure there are times that I have been wrong in, in the way that I approach a recipe, but as long as I can stand by the fact that I like it and I created it so that I liked it, um, even when I am wrong, it doesn't affect the the clarity and decision making as right. an atelier. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is that we always view our work here as a practice mm -hmm. so we're not um which which is a little i'm Cindy, my father's a typical Cindy business person and um uh, you know when when and, and i think i did find investment at the at the back of my father's success so it's really difficult now um growing up in that sort of environment of like Oh, business, quick growth. What are your sales targets? What are your and and for, and for me, as as an art, uh, as as, as an, an artist, as as an artisanal craftsman, it's important that I don't view my success as an as an artisanal craftsmanship as a, a craftsman in terms of growth, but in terms of practice. Right? As as long as I'm coming in, and, and I like to compare that to yoga a lot. Right? It's not about getting better; it's about 
finding peace in doing it the right way in in in, in coming back and and being submerged in the progress of um my skills in a very small incremental way and and okay. that, that does allow me to like have bad days have good days um and that it does allow me to not yeah it's it's very much not a move fast and break things kind of um mm. kind of operation uh the third thing is um about putting it's it's a resource management about how you manage how we manage resources and we always make sure that when we're allocating resources do things most uh most i think um uh obviously financial resources um is in terms of putting craft first uh craft mentorship over commerce of course both very important uh aspects but we will always make sure that we've done the the craftsmanship right before we consider commercial um limitations right yeah. if it's, it's running your own atelier starting your own uh restaurant whatever one thing that i always find it very hard to sort of explain to people that are not functioning from this uh, artisanal headspace is um like i don't i don't care that you're running a chart shop you don't have to have a pani puri if you don't know how to make a good pani puri like if i do not have the resources to do something in the best way possible and i i own this menu i'm just not put it on my menu mm-hmm. um so that's one and then lastly i know this is going on and on but lastly i think in how young um sort of artisanal culture is an artisan culture is in india and either one of those um big tenants of what we do is always function in a way in which we're supporting other artists and other people that are working with the same ethos um i think one of those one of the small examples of that i think um is recently um we're we're working on re- redoing uh, some of our website and um one place that i noticed that we could do better is is we have a lot of bearings right i think it's it's um uh we have we have sort of wine bearings and cheese bearings and and, and beverage and food bearings for all of our chocolates and uh going forward we we've, we've decided to to highlight other artisans in that sort of in those in those specific fields of specialization um you know that is outside of our own like they again i didn't go to school for how many years to study cheese so why am i making these decisions um i'd rather have somebody that is a true expert in that field okay. that, yeah there we are that's great i think the point of um you know pretty when you mentioned um since this community is a young community right now uh even though we see artisan in a very different format in indian perspective you know it's always about the craftsman who is kariger would be a craftsman in india's terminology right uh it's very important that we create this creator economy or like a creator community where you're supporting each other so that um there is space for people to innovate and i think you would it's really uh, right it's it's really i think uh i mean before i address that it's really uh interesting that you mentioned the word kariga right because because even growing up in india that that word is there is an implicit sense of exploitation in it right like the kariga is the one he's seen as the subordinate and and the one that needs to be contracted out to and you tell them what to do and they'll do it and you are in a bargain to make sure that your project is not running over budget So I think in supporting uh the carigars right and and of course in in the luxury space too it's it's about fighting against this and and this is definitely by no mean exclusive to India this um culturally accepted um uh, exploitation of of what we as artists as as non-traditional craftsmen let's say have to offer yeah 
well, but yes, coming back to innovation and, and uh, what, how we view innovation here at Ether. Um, I think there's two ways to look at innovation, right? It's, innovation is all about sort of boundaries and, and exploring beyond those boundaries. Mm-hmm. We at Ether try now, at least, at least I at Ether try very hard to re reassess that spirit of exploration from one that is an exploration of breath to one that is an exploration of depth. Uh, I don't want to make new shapes. I don't want to make new. I don't want to go looking for new um, flavors and, and try and combine new things. I think for me as an artist, and this is very personal, I think this is not good or bad. It, the, the, the true, the thing that excites me most about innovating is within the implicit complexity of these very um, very special almost ingredients that we use here at Ether. If you're going to pay true homage to these these ingredients that come with an incredible amount of, of heritage, uh, historic and, and even uh, supply chain provenance, right? Um, and, 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 you know, the, almost all of the ingredients we use, we make sure that they come from a sense of, um, of discretionary art uh, craftsmanship at every step of their um, supply chain. I think my uh, my approach to innovation is to create innovation in the depth of that ingredient as opposed to play with it to create more with uh, uh, flavors with it. Mm. And it's, so I, I think of it as, um, as as looking below what what I have, looking under what I have, as opposed to building on top of it. Mm-hmm. Very interesting point, because I think one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurial businesses get wrong is that they try to do too much too soon and they haven't really established what their expertise truly is. So, you know, to to try and move into X, Y, Z formats and all these other ideas that come through. I think what comes through with your brand particularly is that it is um, a fabulous example of exactly what luxury really is you are our poster boy for luxury because actually we have we talk a lot about craft and artisan and focusing in on your passion what you're really good at in your point of view um too many people almost are using consumer research as their way of understanding what their brand is going to be but if you don't have a point of view or a passion or a confidence then you may become just quite anodyne you become very neutral and you won't stand out what stands out for me with ether is that your product is superb i know that personally having tried some it is beautiful and it is ahead of a number of brands that I've tried in the UK and in Europe as well. It's certainly at the quality level of Belgian chocolate and above, I would say. So it is really up there in that world class. The packaging is superb. I don't think I've seen such beautiful packaging for a chocolate brand ever. And mm-hmm. that adds to this layering of beautiful luxuriousness. And um, even my husband, who is a chocoholic, is preserving the pieces that I've given to him so that he enjoys it for longer. And that, again, is the essence of luxury for me. You don't just want to eat this or take it all in one. Actually, it's so gorgeous. You want to savor it for much longer. And that's beautiful. That's a lovely way of doing this. So I think you're right in terms of having that confidence. Sorry, this is what I'm doing. If you don't like it, then that's fine. There's other chocolate brands out there. However, this is my point of view. Two, two things are just bounce off of that. Firstly, what, what you just said, right? Hey, this is my chocolate. And if you don't like it, that's fine. I also, like, and this is my soapbox, is I see a lot of, especially now in India, I see a lot of other artists that are trying to, that are, that are functioning in that, that same way. And it, it's very exciting at first. But the more that I speak to some of these people, 
I, I want to make it very clear that that if you are coming at it with if you're going to stand here and tell me that you're an artist and you're going to you're you're something in this artisanal craftsman space then you cannot be one of these you cannot also be a person that says this is how I like it and if you don't like it that's fine that's great but this is how I like it if you don't like it you're wrong no everybody is doing their own thing mm. i th- i think it 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 takes an immense amount of sort of if if you can believe that you're right and somebody else is wrong as opposed to you like it this way versus somebody else likes it a different way mm. then you do not actually think you're right like you mm. do not have the confidence enough in your product or in in the way that you do things to be able to to with maturity say oh this is just this is what i'm doing right mm-hmm. this is and 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 every no matter how luxurious or how mass market something is none of it is invalid mm. i think that's that's very that's so fast personal so fast mm. uh but another thing that i wanted to sort of tether off of that was was when you mentioned packaging right that that is one of those sort of very clear examples of making point to on um on on one of the sort of tenets of 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 being artists know that I mentioned right it's about resource allocation um i 100% like i know that it's pretty we don't need to have packaging that pretty but mm. i cannot imagine running a brand where i do not know that the paper that we use comes from an art house uh paper a papier right like a a a, a legacy paper manufacturer that mm. that spends the sort of time and money to research these very rich dyes and colors and mm. um and all that that good stuff and then on once we've got that we work um we actually we don't uh publicize this a lot we really ought to a little more is uh we run a small scale um uh residencies for artists for for photographers uh mm. here in Italy. and that's where we get a lot of our photography now, of course not the product photography that's consigned but but with a lot of these sort of very abstract lifestyle photos that we use in in our communication in our um in our packaging sometimes mm. um that does come from us just speaking to photographers that we like and saying hey how much money do you need to just live mm um so you need x amount of money to live okay i will give you that x amount of money so you can live you don't need to work and not distracted and then here's some extra money for just supplies mm explore what you want to explore and then whatever comes whatever comes out of it let me license that for free yeah yeah and i think you know this is why again it comes back to the point that your brand is truly a luxury brand because every touch point feels like it's being considered there's nothing about it which feels oh that'll do or oh well we can't really put mon- more money into this your website is beautiful it is artistic it is craft your packaging is beautiful the product is beautiful everything around it feels considered and i think this is really where luxury began and it's where it's drifted away from to become things that are just that the sacrificed on the altar of commerce as you've said or on scale and volume production or or needing to please more people with what you do so you lose that focus and i think we see it in every layer of luxury outside of this where brands start to lose their way some go bust because they don't have a point of view they're not careful about preserving luxury and so that's why again it comes back to the fact that you are probably the best example of a luxury brand at the moment that we found and i know you work with some other brands that are very interesting as well that are equally luxury in their own area but your whole ethos is why it is luxury not that you're trying but it's actually part of your personal belief and and that's what comes through very strongly 
Can, can I just you? ask you a little bit about, um, you know, your sustainability, for example? We talk a lot about this. It's a, it's a core part of our conversation as one of, uh, you know, Zindia's green school, basically. Um, one of the things that we're very keen to convey about sustainability is that you don't need huge initiatives or big programs to really make your brand and your product uh, sustainable. One of the biggest things you can do is to avoid waste. So, so how do you go about avoiding waste in your business? Right. I think um, with sustainability, it is really, really important. At least, again, I'm. However, whatever gets you there, right, is whatever you need to get you there. For me, um, it is about respect. It's, I've contextualized. Um, sustainability in 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 the parlance of respect mm -hmm. um if i'm gonna work with a with a um art house paper maker if i'm gonna work with um uh, these photographers if i'm gonna work with uh, some of the best chocolate from some of the best foundations around the world that chocolate when it comes to me i try and communicate as much as i can to, to everybody that works here at the atelier that that chocolate has not come from the shops. I mean, it has, but mm. it comes from this. It comes from this heritage of, of people in Peru that have, over generations, you know, worked the land sort of endlessly and and, and, and with backbreaking work and in, in, in high sun to, to 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 carefully harvest these these beans that they've then fermented and and mm. even on the commercial side, right? It's it's even on the sort of non non romanticized commercial side just just in terms of supply chain right there's somebody there's hundreds of employees in France that are just sitting on a computer trying to make sure that this this chocolate gets to you just fine um and, and when you're wasting that chocolate if something if something goes to waste um especially in a way that isn't um that, that that wasn't required in, in, in a way that wasn't um, that was unnecessary um, is incredibly disrespectful to the provenance of the chocolate and, and I, I find that unbearable. Um, you know, on the flip side of that, of course, as an as an artisanal company, one thing that I also make sure to communicate to my to my um, uh, to my chefs and and, to, and one thing that I will say to other chefs as well hey, if something goes wrong throw it away start over mm. send it out to your client mm. just mm. you know where you, where you can save things is design your packaging so you'll see very little if any of our packaging is circular because that wastes a lot of paper um, very little of our um, of our print work is uh, in poor color because we want to try and sort of pay respect to these natural dyes. Um, so there's those little ways that aren't, as, as you said, that aren't sort of massive initiatives. The, um, for me, born out of respect for these, uh, the, the provenance of these ingredients mm. and the processes. For somebody else, they might just be, you know, another, another personal motivator, but as long as uh, you can find that personal motivator. Um, you don't need these sort of overarching initiatives, and um, mm. if you can continue to do it without the PR of it, then you can sustain it. I think. I think that <clears throat> unfortunately, the whole problem is that sustainability has become a PR exercise, and therefore, you know, the fact that you just do it and that you are working in ways which are avoiding waste, but with that deep understanding and belief and ethos of uh, not wasting and and not and making sure you respect everything that's part of your process, then that will never be something which is accused of greenwashing because it is what you are. And this is where brands go wrong again in that they don't thoroughly embed these principles into what they do and how they do it. They're actually just surface dressing. They'll, they'll put a nice recycled box onto the pack, but actually fundamentally when you look back to what they are making it with or, or the resource involved in it, then it's, it's not as sustainable. And, and now brands are being called out about it. So, you know, it's an important part of 
being a luxury, I think now. Yeah, and and I think with smaller luxury brands such as ourselves, right? Like, um, I think it's diff- it's expensive. It's an expensive exercise, right? Yes, so for, me, yeah. for me, it's I've fallen into using craft paper and, and all of that, mm. so, so it's not quite as difficult to transition to make sure that they're mm. uh, it's used sustainability. Uh, sustainably. Um, however, with smaller brands, I think it is an expensive and it is a difficult exercise, and, mm. and it is um, sometimes comes down to you know craftsmanship versus sustainability. Mm. And and I personally will, without without shivering, say if if it came down to that, I would pick up the craftsmanship, right? Yeah. I have yeah. um, I have made sure to um, to use dyes that I know aren't sustainable um, because they looked beautiful. Mm. Uh, and as long as as long as you're doing the best you can, right? And you're doing it with a sense of of purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Of, of not of not just for the PR of it. Yeah. I think one. I think people need to to know that as long as they're trying, that's, that it really that, that's yeah. really all anyone's really asking of you is to try yeah. to, to okay. think about it um, and um, if you are somebody that is deeply um, involved in or um, committed to sustainability in these very uh, specific ways um, I think know that that comes again for me it's about respect for you that specificity comes from inherent bias and is very very counterproductive to call other brands out um i i you know i i try never to do that because i know that my ability to be sustainable is a very very direct function of my financial privilege in mm-hmm. this company mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a lot of brands they just can't afford to do it and i think it's kind of reductive to blame them for it yeah it's our job to call out brands that are trying to hide or hoodwink things from the public but it's certainly not our role to criticize those that are doing the best they can and everyone's in a different place Yeah. yeah yeah i think the intent is extremely important you know it's the intent with what you do and i also feel with sustainability helen i think that's very you know the whole conversation comes up it's so important for people to understand what exactly sustainability is mm. you know the, the issue currently what i feel is the industry has uh, limited knowledge when it comes to sustainability even we are learning every single day and there is just so many aspects to becoming a sustainable business it's the practice it's your people it's your product it's a lot of other things so it's just not you know a direct uh, approach that you can take towards sustainability and hence i don't think um, a brand could call themselves a 100% sustainable brand that's something that i don't personally believe uh, in okay. so uh, you know there are a couple of ways um pradeep you you know we were discussing about something very important where you mentioned that what i do I might like it and somebody doesn't like it but there's no right or wrong because I believe there is no right or wrong when it comes to a craft or art that's how it's supposed to be um when it comes to the indian audience because the brand has been there the past 2 years 3 years now um how do you think your audience responds to it like you know are they uh, used to eating the you know the the way chocolates were usually created or they're open to the kind of innovation that you bring to the table what's the response that you think receiving so far right um i can i can speak to this question anecdotally um i think you know in the in the overall sort of hard facts or hard numbers data kind of thing as as i mentioned right now okay um i like it i created for me um anecdotally i think one thing that i find really uh, funny is um how divorced that acceptance of these sort of progressive ideas in food is from 
financial standing mm-hmm. is initially when I started this this brand and of course a lot of our pricing strategy is just a function of how expensive our ingredients are they aren't we aren't you know incredibly highly priced when you um, look at just our cost of goods um but yeah when I when I first had my first menu and the prices mentioned um I was like, oh, you're targeting a high net worth, high net worth clientele and each clientele. And I was like, sure, if you say so. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, a, a luxury buyer, if you will. Um, and I think over the last three years, I've found that, that that's just not the kind of person that, that shops at Ether. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of people like come back to Ether and are, and are religious followers of, of what we do. Our, um, our people that that are just well to do enough to be able to afford the chocolate. Uh, in in some cases, we also have a lot of people that save up to to buy um, mm. the, the 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 work that we do, um, and um, they're never and and these are just not ever the people that will sort of disrespectfully try and bargain or, or try mm. and undervalue sort of what we do and. Um, I think uh, in 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 the industry at large, we have a very, um, uh, I would say, uh, a, a, a reputation for for not entertaining that that behavior, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I am this person. Like, you must do a better price. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, no. Mm-hmm. If you are this person, you can afford this. You can afford to not disrespect my craftsmanship. Um, yeah, so so yeah, one thing that I've definitely found and I would definitely recommend to um, to uh, chefs that are trying to are on the come up or, or other luxury brands that are on the come up is forget about let create it for you and if someone wants to buy your product don't don't assume who's going to buy your product. Let them come. Mm. Don't, um, I, 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 and I don't know if this is something you've experienced. Like I, I, when I first started, I would get a lot of like, oh, you should definitely give them a better price because they have a great list or they have a great list of contacts. And and I will go on record to say every time I've done that, that entire group of contacts has never come back to me yeah. in a way. To, uh, with respect because they know that I, I discounted it for this person yeah. or, or that I don't that that my to me my my product is not worth the price that I'm putting out if yeah. I was willing to discount it or give it out to this yeah. person yeah so and again well, you know lux- luxury is is not really about discounting in fact we always say that the golden rule in luxury is not to cut the price because the, as soon as you cut the price people start to think it wasn't worth what you were asking in the first place. And it's all about buying a dream and, and dreams are priceless from that point of view. And I think it's so interesting and, and really inspiring actually that people not only come back to you because the product quality is excellent, but that people will save up to buy you. You know, That yeah. is uh, something that would be incredibly heartwarming, I think, for any brand that they Wonderful. think enough of you that they would give up other things to be able to buy you eventually. So, you know, fantastic. And, and not assuming you know who's going to buy the product is is a great tip. No, it is. It is. And, and that and, and I, I mean, sometimes the same people, but, but also there's, um, I know, a lot of people that will uh, have either be just on their bucket list of uh, mm. things to do when they're in Bombay, and which is very heartwarming since we're not physical brand, right? We're just in Italy. We, we sell online. We deliver across India, but they're like, mm. no, when I'm in Bombay, I must. Mm-hmm. It, it's a Bombay thing. I'm yes. like, well, you can, you can get it wherever you are. And like, <laughs> no, but I'm no you want to be there. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it is incredibly heartwarming. Mm. Things of mm. us. I think that's where the appreciation for the craft also comes in, you know, when you really like the product, you want to experience the product. And when somebody comes back to your brand, that's when actually they start appreciating your product more. Mm. Because it just cannot be one time thing, you know, you would want to carry on or live with that product 
that's actually something that you associate with i always uh, you know talk about a point luxury uh, is an extension of your personality you know you're not supposed to like everything that's luxurious mm. you're supposed to resonate with a product and that becomes yours and it's part of you mm. so i think uh, that's important it's funny if i could just bounce off of that so one more thing is you again luxury as you said is a, is a part of who you are it's an extension of of your interests and that is why i find it very difficult that smaller quote unquote luxury brands will have the same product line and for like years on end exactly. like i Okay, I wait, where is it? I was a cringy college student once and I bought this like very cringy MGM bag and mm-hmm. I like like will absolutely like hate being seen in public with it because of how cringy I think it is uh, with the sort of monogram all over it. Um I will like make excuses for it. I've lied about it being vintage once. Um <laughs> And yeah like as a buyer as a luxury buyer as a person I've changed from when I bought that and I think I think it very strange that that would not reflect in the product offered by by a luxury brand Yeah right good point yes. Um Pratik I think one thing that I would like to end today's conversation is with this very interesting read that i was reading i think a month back it's got skin in the game it's by nasim talib and he mentions that you know whatever business that you do if you don't go deep into it you don't know the quirks of the business and then you just uh, you have a peripheral view of it right and i think 3 years down the line the brand is just being phenomenal in terms of going as deep as it can and i think that comes from your integrity of what you're doing and that's the approach at least that i understand the way you've taken this whole um, you know from creation of the brand and approaching it so i wish you all the very best it's just such a fabulous start and uh, i think that's a very important point for all the entrepreneurs watching this it's very important to have your team as deep as you can put your skin into it and i think that's when innovation happens and that's where product yeah. is born and i mean also i will i will So you know it takes a village it's it's not all me mm. um, it's it's a, uh, have a team that you trust allow your team to make mistakes yeah uh you do too you're just the boss so no one can call you out for it um allow them to grow into cuz cuz i think one very toxic thing that artists do a lot is oh like i could have done that better mm. and you know what i'm here to tell you that's right you could have done that better but you don't have 48 hours in every day to do it uh and if you just give it some time with your team if you it's not about training it, you can train them as well as you like but they're never going to be able to do it and they're doing it right they're just not doing it the way that like that that, that your taste and it's it's not right or wrong it's just oh i would have liked it in this lighter yeah. fuchsia yeah uh right. let them no matter how well you train them that sort of understanding of how you see the brand and how you see the craftsmanship will only come with time so give your team time to grow into you as a person allow yourself to grow into your team um so you can function as sort of one unit to create sort of things absolutely definitely takes a village and i'm sure um you know that's where even your vision comes into it and how are you taking them a little more closer to what your vision towards the brand is um thank you so much for the first lovely conversation helen any sense on that from well it's great and it's been a real treat to talk to you directly and to to hear your your journey and your principles because it just absolutely comes through then in in the brand and in every touch point that that brand has with the consumer it does take a village you're quite right and i think your whole brand whole team approach is something that a lot of businesses could actually learn from including some in the uk actually just because somebody doesn't do it quite as you want them to 
doesn't mean it's wrong it just means it was a bit different and a different interpretation so i think that um, ability to take other inputs is, is really really important from within the team so thank you so much for your time i think what what you've shared today is really going to help other entrepreneurs who are thinking or challenging themselves about you know where are they on this luxury scale and i for one will carry on talking about you because i think yeah. yours is a brand that people need to get to know and we want to make sure that that's something that respect it builds respect for indian entrepreneurship and luxury as well around the world not just in terms of the commercial opportunities which as a, an artisan you say is not your primary but i'm sure if you had yeah. more sales then it wouldn't be do. yes that would be great but it's not at the risk and the cost of your craft which is is phenomenal so thank you so much and um I'll I'll be back to see you when I'm in Mumbai no doubt. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.